All right, so thank you everyone for your patience. Um, rookie mistake on my end, but I'd like to take, thank Shane on his day off for helping me get set up. So I'm very excited to speak um, here at the Ethics Village, and as you can see by the slide, I am talking about ethical disclosure and the reduction of harm, and I will tell you what that means in a bit. But first, um, my name is Jen. Um, I am the Chief Marketing Officer of a company called Flashpoint, and I know a lot of you don't necessarily work closely with a lot of marketing teams and might be wondering, why is there a marketing person giving a talk here about this? But I'm going to explain that. So I'll, uh, oops, he told me to do this. There we go. C2. Yeah. So this is what many people think, especially in the tech community, about, about marketers. We're scary. I need to, there we go. Hold on. I'm hiding the toolbar. I'm doing something wrong. We're just going to deal with it like this. We're just not going to waste any more time. Um, you know, we're, we're scary, allegedly. We create a lot of chaos, et cetera. But the reality is that to build an industry, you need marketing, you need sales, you need all those things that necessarily, you know, folks here aren't necessarily uh, interested in doing. Um, but they might be employed by folks that need those very mechanisms to move their companies forward. Um, the reason, so the reason I'm doing this talk right now, I've been in security marketing now for almost 20 years. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff go well. I've seen a lot of stuff go really bad. I've made mistakes myself. And I am uh, extremely passionate about making my people, so being marketing and business leaders, behave more responsibly. It's not about how you disclose, but be more responsible in the way that they run business and make business decisions when it comes to disclosure, so they're not jeopardizing the user, they're not jeopardizing the community, they're not uh, discrediting research. Um, and that's some, worked with a lot of different organizations that I've been at on their coordinated disclosure policies. Wink to Katie. Um, and uh, so that's why I'm here today. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for marketers and business leaders and the technical community to work together for a more ethical approach to business. So whether you work for a manufacturer where, where you might be putting something out that uh, just to sell to commercial uh, to consumer audience, or whether you work for a security vendor and you're looking, you're on the defender side, um, and you're responsible for reporting things out or keeping things protected, uh, then oh, 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 I have a helper now. Thank you. Um, so really simplified, and we could probably argue or fight all day about uh, the nuances around these. But just some questions to think about as I head into this talk: um, What do manufacturers do? They try to make stuff that doesn't harm. Now we all know, we're all here at DEF CON because we know that is not, that's not always the case, but I doubt anyone's ever creating something for a child that they want to be malicious, I hope at least. Maybe I'm just naive or ethical. Uh, what do security vendors do? Sell stuff intended to reduce harm. That's, I know that's a big well of, of crazy because, yeah, but in general, in theory, that is what their goal is most of the time. Uh, what are researchers, engineers, practitioners, that's usually a word that I just land on, work to reduce harm. Now, the different ways that we do it, the different ways that they go about it, whether they're offensive researchers, or whether reverse engineering, et cetera, we can get into the ethics of all of that, but we're not going to go there now. But what do marketers often do? Create risk. We create risk and sensationalize. We try to do what's best. Our job is to amplify the message, build a narrative, and amplify the message for our company. The problem is that too many marketers in our industry are not taking the time to understand what the companies are intending to do, and even the marketers that are maybe on risk or on comms teams for larger manufacturers that are responsible for reporting when there's some kind of disclosure that's necessary are thinking more about how much noise can we make with this, not how do we get this out in a way that doesn't hurt anyone, that doesn't reduce harm. And they need to get there. I'm very passionate about that. I mentioned that already. Um, and there are some good folks out there, obviously, but it, you know, this is going to tie into uh, why we also need the research community to help us and how, on top of that, the research community needs to be empowered by us to advocate. If you work in an organization, for instance, that doesn't have someone on the business leadership team or the marketing team that gives a shit about ethics, how do you go to them and how do you appeal to their senses 
and what's going to scare them into what's going to happen to the business in terms of if they, if they keep violating court and disclosure. Yes? Uh, so, Christoph just asked if the, uh, if the marketing behavior is bleeding over from logo disclosure, essentially. Every time there's a new vuln or something disclosed, there's a logo or song. I'm actually going to talk about the patient zero of that in a couple minutes. So, bear with me for a second. Oh, thank you again. Ha! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even a setup. <laughs> so, everybody. Unethical. <laughs> So, um, I assume everybody knows what this is. No. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, this was, I was talking to my friend earlier, called Patient Zero for the worst logo disclosure and, and what sent marketing teams on a tear thinking that this is a good idea. So, we all know about Heartbleed. We all know that OpenSSL called it a heartbeat flaw. Codenomicon, now part of Synopsis, I believe, um, went ahead, their marketing person was like, we're going to register that domain. We're going to hire someone to do a logo. We're going to do that because we want to help educate and inform. That's called branding. And that was a quote from a CMO. She's full, yeah, unethical, right? They're, we just want to help educate and inform. But it created so much chaos because what would happen is this stupid heart showed up everywhere. And then people started making assumptions so many response teams, or in, in all kinds of different teams actually, were thrown into a tizzy, that got on the radar because it was all over every business channel, news site, CEOs, CFOs, et cetera, were calling their, their CISOs, were calling their security teams, screaming and yelling about this thing and distracting them from actually doing something to protect their users. We can't have this anymore. And I know that there are some companies, I know that there are some teams, some research teams that I love and work very closely with that still do branded disclosure. I don't, even as a marketer, I, I don't support that. I think it detracts from the seriousness of the situation and I think it just creates a lot of noise that gets in the way of good people trying to do their jobs. Next slide, thank you. So, what I just said. I would like to put a lot of that stuff. I can't do this just myself. I need other business leaders, other marketing leaders. I need folks in the tech community to think about some of the business side of stuff. We all know that marketing sucks. I mean, I love it. But we know, there's a, I, I, I do a podcast with a few people every con, and there's a joke about how often I use the hashtag fire your marketers. Because there's just, it's just a bunch of fluff and a bunch of noise a lot of the time, but it can be good. And this is not to talk to you guys about how to do good marketing because you probably all run out of the room. That's not your path. But what we need to do is work together to get rid of that old approach to disclosure uh, when it comes to not necessarily, again, disclosing the volumes and how to disclose them, but when they come on the radar of business and marketing leaders, what do we do with them? How do we make sure that there's a process, there's an approach that doesn't break more shit? So... This is something I'm very big on. If you, I'm not gonna paraphrase what's on here, if you work in the security industry, whether you are in marketing, you're in finance, any other back office, HR, and you don't care about the end game, the mission of securing people, get out. There are plenty of other things you can market, right? Flobies, are those still around? Um, <laughs> So, I mean, get out. You, you, you need to, security needs to be everyone's responsibility. Now, it's a little different when you get into those larger organizations, those manufacturing firms I was talking about where not everybody at a, you know, huge, uh, I don't know, video game company is going to care about security. But if you are on a team within that company and part of your job is to work with the security engineering team, et cetera, and you're like, this is just a job, I don't care about security, you should probably find something else to do because it's important that we understand what we're doing and the impact of what we're doing. And really, if I may say so, and I will because I'm holding this microphone, um, it's kind of a marketing 101 thing. If you don't understand your audience and the impact of what you're saying, you shouldn't be saying it. So maybe you should go work with Floby. I don't know. So 
that's kind of where they start. So this is, this is what I really want to focus on today. I, this is my, as a CMO, I'm extremely artistic, as you can tell. But this is my disclosure decision tree. And someday I will hire maybe the same graphic artist that a heart bleed, kidding, to make it prettier. But this is a, my thought process, and this is how I operate when I'm working with the researchers and the security teams um, in my companies, and even when I work with our researchers with other companies on coordinated disclosure. So WireX would have been one example of that where we had to work together on the coordination there. So we applied this methodology. So there's a vuln. Was it shared with the company that is vulnerable or has a vulnerable product? No. Stop. Don't do it. Good example of this one, recent, CTS Labs versus AMD. You guys remember that? Where CTS just went ahead and disclosed everything and made a whole bunch of noise. And sure, there were actually vulnerabilities, but created a lot of nonsense that was unnecessary. And then also the way that the CEO that kept saying, well, I'm not a marketing person, but I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. And I'm like, maybe you should hire a marketing person in this case. But just don't do it. If you haven't disclosed to the organization that has a product that it needs to fix. Obviously, there are exceptions here. This is not black and white. That is not one of them. Stop. At least stop and think about it. If it's a malware vulnerability, if it'll tip off a cyber criminal. So if you're one of those companies that likes to break news that you have a ransomware vaccine and you want to share with the whole world that you figured out that there is a flaw in this ransomware. Who do you think the first person is that's going to realize, that's going to take this information and fix their stuff? Threat actor, the author, right? Don't run out with it. Don't do it like that. Work with the community that you're in. Work with your research teams. Coordinate all that stuff. Don't, don't just put it out there. I've seen that so much. And then I get really angry when I see the journalists writing about it too because they should know better, but we'll save that for, for a therapy session at some point. <laughs> so if it's shared with the company, yeah, consider it. Okay, you agree, timeline, blah, blah, blah. We all know how disclosure works, so I won't get into that. Is it coordinated? Are you on agreement of when, how, who needs to be notified, what needs to be done first? What is the timeline? Are you in agreement on the timeline? Are you in agreement on how you communicate it? Who communicates it? Is it something that needs to be, to be shared with customers? Always share with your cu the customers first, right? Don't make a media circus before your clients are taken care of. So if it's not coordinated, stop. If it is, keep going. Then you ask yourself the question, is this actually going to help people if we put it out there broadly? Is this just creating something that we're hoping is going to drive traffic to a website or is going to make us look like the biggest, baddest security company in the world? Um, if it's not educational, if it's something that's just like, hey, we found this thing, I don't know what to do about it, you're screwed. Bye. Don't do it. Stop. Right? If it is, if there's value, if there's something that people can learn, if you're going to do an emergency, I sound like a marketer, but that's who I am, emergency webinar or something like that on what you need to know about this immediately. We spin those up a lot. Um, then there's something that you can do there that actually helps people, then go for it. Message not scary or spun, otherwise known as FUD, if you're uncertainty doubt, right? Just don't do it. You don't ever, if you have to, I've said this a lot, I'll say it again. If you have to scare someone into buying your shit, it's not good. It's not a good product. You shouldn't have to scare anyone into using your technology or using your, your stuff. So there's no reason to go out there and scare users. Um, a recent example of this where it wasn't necessarily scary or spun, it was more stupid, um, was BitFi. You guys familiar with that story? Their unhackable crypto wallet? There were all kinds of issues with that. I won't get into the whole technology side of that because that is not my wheelhouse. I'll let you guys all research and debate that. But never call something unhackable because whether you offer a bounty or not, you're just inviting an army of people to rip you apart. You look ridiculous. And the other part of it is, sure, to us in this community where we're aware and we know that that's a bad thing to do, and we're going to question it, and you guys are going to rip that stuff apart. That's one thing, but they're also marketing that to people that know nothing about security and won't question it. And I don't know if you guys saw the whole thing about the hologram stickers. Like, we have hologram stickers now, and if, oops, 
There we go. Thank you. Uh, we have hologram stickers now. And if you already have a device, we'll send you a sticker to put on your device to show that it's secure. What? <laughs> so just the whole message was wrong on that for so many reasons. That wasn't really a disclosure. That was just bad marketing. But it's been annoying me so much that I had to share it with you all. Um, this one, I can't step over because I'll get in trouble. Um, the re are the researchers credited? There's so many companies that are like, oh, you know, this is great. Thank you for this discovery. You know, it really looks better for the company if we put it out in the CEO's name or such and such name or such and such company research team. Uh -uh. Do not allow that. It's your work. You're the one putting your ass on the line, your OPSEC, your time, all of that. Stand up for that. And I'll go a little bit uh, into uh, checking time just since we started late. Um, a little bit more into how you might be able to do that. Researchers are credited? Yes. Researchers not credited? No. I ran into a situation not at my current company but a previous company where we were coordinating something with another company and they were adamant about not putting the researchers' names on it. And we pulled back our support from disclosure. They decided to do one on their own. It was a flop. They got ripped apart. The comms person got fired from that other company. So it's a good lesson learned. Um, and they deserved it, quite frankly. So <laughs> you're like, what is this chick babbling about? <laughs> um, this is obviously, and those of you that aren't, you know, especially those of you that aren't on the business or marketing side, which is probably most of you, um, I appreciate you sitting through this and actually taking an interest in this. Um, it's coming kind of out of left field. It's very rare for someone in my position to be like, you know what? My people need to do a better job um, and we need your help to do a better job and all of that. So I just wanted to take a breather for a second before we can get into what are some ideas. Of what I've talked about what we shouldn't do. I've talked to giving examples of what's gone wrong. I've talked about the flow chart, which is kind of dipping into what we should do. Um, but now I want to talk about how we actually create this like disclosure utopia that I'm talking about. Thank you. So this is just an idea I have. So a lot of major news organizations um, have standards desks. Um, basically the folks on the standards desks are ombudsmen or ombudswomen and they are responsible for looking at articles, looking at content, news stories before they go out um, to ensure that there's that everything's solid. It's fact checked. It's a story that needs to go out. It's a story that's not just go out and create chaos, right? Um, it's not something that's going to put anyone in further danger. It's not something that's going to get them sued. There's all kinds of other things on there. But what if we had the concept of a standards desk for any team that was responsible for working with the researchers on disclosure? And again, this is really focusing, this piece is really focusing on those vendors that are working with other companies uh, more than independent researchers and so on. That's a different topic. But what if we could do that? What if every company had some kind of standards initiative or standards desks, desk when they um, were looking at how to take this stuff out, similar to the flow chart I just showed? Next slide. Thank you. So how it should work. This is very similar to what we do at our company. And one of the things I love about it is that everybody buys into it. It's very natural. We're a very security focused company for a threat intelligence firm. Um, that's obviously very important. So never use, you know, your analysts, your researchers, your engineers as a content repository. Don't just take their stuff. Oh, wow, I just saw this. We see a lot of intelligence reports roll through. And it would be very easy for us, though it wouldn't last long, I'm sure, for us to take those reports and just publish them as blogs. One, there's a lot of information in there that would need to be sanitized to protect tradecraft, to protect sources, to protect a customer, and so on. So we don't do that. But a lot of companies do that. They'll look and say, like, oh, so-and-so did a paper on this. I'm not going to talk to them about this because they work for our company, and therefore it's ours, and I can do what I want with it. <laughs> That's not okay. So you need to collaborate. And that's another way to ingratiate yourself. Um, and if you're on the research or engineer or on the practitioner side, like I said, um, you have every right to request and demand that that not happen. Um, in my team case, uh, we work really closely with our intelligence and research teams. So when we see those reports and we're like, ooh, shiny, I want to market this, first we do a read through for our own get go checks. Then we work directly with our head of intelligence and I'm like, all right, is there anything in here? Is there any reason why we shouldn't do this? First thing he always asks me is, what's the point? What do you want to do with this? Do you, then so I'll tell him whatever my harebrained idea is 
And if it's safe and if we can sanitize and if we can, if it makes sense, then we'll go ahead and put that out. That's just one example. Um, challenge everyone, I talked about this a little bit. Everybody in the org needs to care about security outcomes. Everybody needs to be responsible for security outcomes. Um, if you are, we had this conversation the other day too around enforcing everyone to care about or be responsible or accountable for security. Um, if you work at a company where there are business, part, business units, there are going to be executives that are in charge of those business units. A lot of times they're officers of the company, which means they have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the company. And that means protecting the company on every level. So they should be held equally accountable um, for educating their teams and also making the right decisions, like running any new tools that they buy that especially might have data in it through their security teams to make sure that they're, you know, they're okay to use. Um, double check with multiple folks to ensure that there's no FUD, um, proper attribution to the analyst or the researcher, OPSEC's never compromised, sources are protected, and tradecraft is protected. Um, th that's the way it really should work, at least in my view of the world, and it works pretty well, I think. Thank you. You're like, still, why? Why should I care about this? Um, we can go to the next one. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the more technical teams can do to help with this initiative. Most of the time it's, ugh, marketing sucks. Why do they do this? Ugh, did you see this thing that this marketing team did? Start explaining why. Create a culture shift. Um, talk to your you know, colleagues, employers. So, for instance, if you if you're looking at this and you're like, yeah, my, I work with these people, or maybe I don't work for a vendor right now, but I know someone or whoever, and they think, I think they really need to see this, or I think they need to understand this. Um, talk to your manager, or talk to that person, or talk to that colleague in the next week or so. Like, just have a conversation. Hey, I saw this talk at DEF CON. This crazy lady with chickens and demons and stuff was talking about how wait a second, it's not all on us and we're put in bad positions and we need to educate them on how to better treat our research and any disclosures that we need to do. Start with that. Bring that up in a conversation. It's not a very common one, which is probably why I'm here giving that, this talk. Um, if they don't have a coordinated disclosure policy, build one. Take the initiative. If that's, an, if that's a position that you could be in or are in or push someone to do it. Um, we are not a security company is not a good answer. We hear that sometimes. Um, just because you're not a security company doesn't mean that you shouldn't have some kind of disclosure policy as long as you're selling, if you're selling something that could potentially cause harm if anything bad happened to it. Um, require credit for your work. I've already been on that a bunch. Um, call out the marketers, but like I said earlier, focus on sharing how to do better. Like, hey, this is what happened because we made this decision, not you did it again, you suck. You know, this is what happened because we did this. If they don't have an oh no response, again, that goes back to should they be working in security, that's probably not for you to tell them or decide, I don't advocate that, but helping to educate. I think there's a big divide that everyone can benefit from if it got much smaller, and I think starting to actually communicate and recognize that we really are on the same teams, just different people have different experiences and understandings of what we're trying to do, and it's all of our jobs to help each other. So we can go to the next slide. So, oh, my animation's not gonna work now. That's okay. Um, so we don't wanna create risk and sensationalize anymore. Um, and again, like I said, I keep saying business leaders as well. Sometimes CEOs are the ones that are hamming and marketing teams because they say, no, we have to do this now. They need to be educated as well. Now, it might be easy for me to say, as a CMO, to be like, I'm just telling my CEO, no. Not everybody's in that position. And that's where some of the collaboration and education can help um, because, you know, other folks that aren't maybe a senior organization or aren't as mouthy as I am might not, um, you know, be able to, uh, to, to have those conversations as openly. Um, next slide, thank you. So I would love this to be our state where we actually reduce harm through the ways we work with our research teams to disclose um, by providing better education, by ensuring that we're not scaring the end users, we're not scaring anyone who's consuming the information, um, and that we're not uh, just, you know, 
putting up logos and, and like theme songs, as Chris said, just to try to, to get more attention. I'd love that to be the state. I realize that is very far off from where we are now, but I think we can get there. <laughs> and then everybody's happy. Right? It's not that simple. Um, obviously, this is just kind of a primer, just a discussion for this village. Um, but, you know, I think there are, there's so many more opportunities that we have as whether you're a hacker, whether you are a, an analyst, whether you're an engineer or a marketer, business leader, salesperson, et cetera, to actually understand in this industry, to understand what the other folks are doing and, and how we might be hurting each other at times, mar largely my side of the fence. Um, and in order to, for that to change, we just need people to speak up and say, hey, stop messing with us. You're actually hurting people more. So that's all I got. And I'm happy to take, how are we on time? I kind of rushed through since I was late. Good. Uh, any questions? Yes. So if you your Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the question is, have I compared the super basic yet fantastical disclosure decision tree against other, other frameworks like SEI, et cetera, for disclosure? Um, I have looked at those, absolutely. And in lo building this out, I really thought about it more from their perspective, not of disclosing, actually doing the disclosure of the vuln or disclosure of, of a breach or something, more about how to maintain discipline and structure on the business side so they're not pushing the research team to do something that they shouldn't do. I don't know if that makes sense or not. So it's, they, they align, but they're going to be much different steps and different thought processes, at least on, on that, where, in the world I live in, at least. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you solve that? It'd be interesting if a salesperson gave the same POV in the other half of this talk about their love or hatred of marketing, because I think that's the other or at least one of the other index points. So yeah. do do you would you see a significant um, gap between what a person who is in sales who's ethical and I know we're talking about uniforms and super Pretty much. Do you think that they would have a markedly different perspective? I'm not even sure how to recap that question, really. But <laughs> so, if a salesperson were to give this talk, how different would it look, given the gap between marketing and sales? Um, and there are different perspectives because marketing is primarily a driver for sales to meet your number. So how was that? Was that a good recap? All right, perfect. Um, marketing. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked that. Marketing and sales always have a love and hate relationship, and there's, there's going to be friction. It needs to be healthy friction. I tell my team all the time, oh, they're, they're going to blame us for everything, and we're going to blame them for everything, and it's never going to change, and that's just how it works, and accept it, don't take it personally, just keep being better than they are. And, um, <laughs> but the, if, if, and I do have some of these conversations with our head of sales, who's great. Have a good, again, there's still the healthy friction. Um, and we have, like... I think if a salesperson were to give this, they would say, it really depends on who it is. If they, if they live and die by the number, and they're like, we've got to meet the number at any cost because I got to get my team paid, and I got to keep them motivated, and the board's going to be breathing down my neck, so I need to do this, they'll be like, fuck this tree, right? Get, get rid, no, I, no, no, I'm doing whatever I want. 
And that's where I come in is like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Nothing goes out unless I say so. Um, but not every organization is like that. Um, but there are other sales folks, like ours, I hope. I'm pretty sure I've never seen this, where I can say, hey, you know, I know we really need to get this out. I know we really want to do this. We need to train people. Going back to the comment, actually, earlier in the question, you said a lot of times marketing develops messaging. If an engineer has the same deck, they'll skip through the marketing messaging, go straight into the stuff. I, no one should ever make an engineer do marketing messaging, by the way. That's not their job. I don't know. That's a bad marketer. Fire your marketer. Um, so, the, um, but, uh, so going back to that, it, it just having a logical conversation about, look, there are short-term gains and there are long-term gains. Gains, And if we miss this quarter because we decide to do something ethical, it's going to pay off longer in the business. And if we explain this to the board in a way where we're protecting their long-term investment, they're going to understand. So you just need to basically have people that are willing to speak up and not shy away from someone that's like trying to scare you with, I need to make the number. Does that? Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, is there any uh, instance, so if it's something created by an analyst, et cetera, that doesn't get, go through the, the decision tree, the market tree? The, 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 do mixed things happen on your side where they're like, oh, this is good, I don't need to go through this, and then they just publish it? Uh, mistakes have happened. They are quickly rectified. Uh, and then we put more process in place to ensure that doesn't happen again. So, re sorry, repeating the question. So, basically, do mistakes happen? Does stuff go out when it shouldn't? Most of my team, in, the, in my current environment, is pretty, anyone that has any responsibility or any uh, ability to get anything out uh, without uh, my approval or my eyes on it or one of the other senior members of the team's eyes on it are very well trained, well versed, have spent a lot of time, the researchers have spent a lot of time with security teams, et cetera. But there's still things that, that miss gut check. Because you can never replace gut check. So there, there have been situations before, especially around the topics of physical security, where something's gone out and the quality of the content was really good, but I've been like, why the heck are these images in there? We shouldn't be perpetuating these images. Take those out. Things like that, where it's just a gut check thing. And then they learn and they go, as they go. Um, but there's lots of other content, obviously, that goes out from companies that don't necessarily need to go through this. If you are working on an RFI or some kind of project directly for a client, that's not going to come through marketing. The client's not going to want that. We don't want that either. It's just before it goes out to a broad base um, or on the website or through media, et cetera, et cetera, that's where you want to apply this and make sure that you're involving those decision makers. Um, I think one more question. And Yes, sir. Sorry, can you repeat that? I can hear you oh, the door. Like, uh, a code monkey might tell somebody in marketing or tell somebody in general, like, this is a problem, I have a vulnerability, there's a, this violation, this PCI violation here, mm -hmm. and uh, some people might just run crazy with that. I, I don't know how to communicate with marketing. Do so, uh, you have any advice on how to report an issue? Sure. So the question is, how does a code monkey, quoting, um, communicate with marketing or whomever uh, more effectively when they see something that shouldn't be done? Because um, it sounds like from what you're saying that they don't listen. Or, they, or you say no and they run with it anyway? Or Massive misunderstanding. Ma Got it. Okay, so it's just bad communication, either sensationalized or it's, it's belittled and it's not as effective as it could be. So some advice there would be, um, think, and you may already be doing this, but just for like the broader room and anybody else might have this question, um, I, start by asking questions. Why do you want to do this this way? 
why do you think it's important to put this out this way? They might not even have an answer. They might say, well, this is the way that we've done it in the template. Sadly. Um, and then you can say, why don't you think about this another way, right? Yeah, sounds familiar, right? Um, so that's one way to go about it. The other thing is to, especially if it's something, for instance, that's customer facing, if there's something you disclose to customers, say, look, it is your responsibility to make sure that we communicate clearly to our customers and make sure that they understand because this is where you appeal to their pain point. If they don't understand, we don't properly inform them, we don't help them the right way, we're going to turn these customers and it's going to be because of bad marketing. So, you know, marketers, like I just said it myself, you have to turn your customers and it hurts because you're responsible for, for not help making that happen or helping not to make that happen. So I think a lot of it is in delivery, appealing to, a lot of times I think what I've seen with um, code monkeys, as you said, coming to the marketing teams, they've said, you can't do this because of this and I saw this and this and that. They don't understand what any of that means. I don't understand what any of that means. I just understand this conceptually, which is what I'm here to do, quite frankly. But if you appeal to the things that are important to a marketer, making the numbers, good reputation, telling the right story for the company, not pissing people off, um, not getting in trouble for getting in the way of a sale, those are, those are some ways that you can go about having those conversations. And if you're talking to someone and they're not listening and it really is an issue, escalate it. Go over their head. So... All right, I think that's it. So, what am I doing with this? Um, I have a packet squirrel nuts for networks giveaway to whoever. Actually, I'm going to give it to you because that was a really good question. I'm going to give it to the Code Monkey question, Ray. <laughs>